Thank you uh, for joining for today's Grand Rounds. Um, I'm going to start by introducing our speaker. Dr. Christy Kuhn is the Scoville Endowed Chair, Head of the Division of Rheumatology, and an Associate Professor of Medicine and Immunology and Microbiology at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus in Aurora, Colorado. She serves as the Chair of the American College of Rheumatology Committee on Research and serves on the Executive Committee of the Spondyloarthritis Research and Treatment Network. She received her MD and PhD in Immunology at the University of Colorado. She then completed uh, her internal medicine residency, chief residency, and rheumatology fellowship at Barnes Jewish Hospital at Washington University in St. Louis. In 2013, Dr. Kuhn returned to the University of Colorado to establish her independent research program. She is an internationally recognized researcher leading an NIH funded research program focused on the hypothesis that specific micromucosal interactions influence the generation of systemic inflammation and the development of spondyloarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. She has ongoing and published studies mechanistically connecting microbiome, metabolome, and mucosal immune changes during the development of animal models of these diseases, as well as in human cohorts. And with that, I'd like to introduce our, or I'd like to invite our speaker, Dr. Kuhn. So I am excited to be uh, with you today to share our stories about understanding mucosal barriers for axial spondyloarthritis but I will also um, kind of tongue in cheek talk about some of the other barriers for understanding uh, axial spondyloarthritis um, from a clinical uh, standpoint. And so I'll start with that and tell you a little bit. Um, first, just my disclosures real quick that I have received honoraria from UCB and I do have a grant uh, for research from Pfizer. I'm not going to talk about um, any of these medications uh, by these companies today. So learning objective, objectives are to recognize and initiate the diagnosis and treatment of axial spondyloarthritis, identify underlying immunologic pathways of axial spondyloarthritis, and connect diseases that are associated with AXPA. So what is AXPA? And the old concept that's often taught in medical school was that ax, axial spondyloarthritis is this Ankylosing spondylitis um, synonym, it affects young Northern European descent males that causes a progressive fusion of the spine. And I think many of us have probably seen this, uh, this photograph um, of the progression from a young man and as he ages, he starts to become uh, more stooped and there's a loss of the lumbar curvature, there's kyphosis and then ankylosis of the full spine. However, more recently, studies are starting to show us that the prevalence of this disease is equal between men and women. It is a global disease. And there's this entity called non-radiographic that I think gets a bad rap because we think of this meaning all imaging is negative, but it really is meant to be that radiographs or x-rays do not show evidence of disease. And the hopes being that we're able to detect this disease at a much earlier time um, in its course and so that we can intervene. And as a result of this, we're starting to appreciate more and more uh, women and more and more uh, individuals from around the world who have this disease. This is a picture that kind of shows the prevalence of AXPA. And I would argue that in some of these countries where the prevalence is low, it just might be a recognition bias um, and not a true prevalence. So nevertheless, around the world, it's about 1% prevalence. So one of the first barriers that I want to talk about with regards to axial spondyloarthritis is our limited knowledge of the epidemiology and outcomes in diverse populations. What has been traditionally studied is, uh, as I said, men of European descent. But we're learning that there's no sex differences in the prevalence and that women experience greater diagnostic delay as shown here in uh, this graph. And so if we look at in the blue triangles versus the blue dots, that is the difference between the age of symptom onset for men versus the age of diagnosis for men, which is a little under 10 years. But if you look at the age of onset in the red triangles for women, 
versus age of diagnosis for women in the dots, you can see that that difference or that time gap is much greater in women. And so not only do women experience greater diagnostic delay, we're also learning that women are likely to respond to and maintain um, lot are less likely to respond to a treatment and maintain therapy, um, often having to switch therapies more frequently than men. At the end of the day though, both sexes have similar disease burden, but can present quite differently. And so when we think about, uh, about spondyloarthritis, we're starting to move away from the, the older terms of ankylosing spondylitis, psoriatic, expired, uh, psoriatic ar arthritis, and other terms, and really thinking about this as an axial versus peripheral disease. And this helps us frame the diseases and understand that broader uh, sex, gender, racial, and ethnic diversity, if we start to think about these diseases with these broader terms. And so thinking about uh, axial disease, we're really focused on spine. And even though the spine is involved, other sites can be involved. It can be asymmetric, oligoarticular, meaning only a couple of joints um, of these peripheral joints involved. And so uh, when we divide that into the axial disease, we can have underneath that umbrella things like ankylosing spondylitis, this entity that's non-radiographic axial spondyloarthritis, psoriatic uh, arthritis that affects the spine, and even IBD-associated disease. On the side of peripheral disease, where you really don't have spine involvement, it's mostly just peripheral joints, again, you kind of have very similar diseases being uh, uh, recognized here, where there's psoriatic arthritis, reactive arthritis, IBD-associated peripheral spondyloarthritis, and undifferentiated peripheral spondyloarthritis, in which means we really haven't put them into a specific bucket yet. And the reason we want to categorize individuals as being predominantly axial or peripheral is because it's gonna impact treatments, which I will discuss later on in the talk. So how do we get to the diagnosis of axial spondyloarthritis? And this has probably been a, a real um, deficit in the field is because we still use a clinical diagnosis and we don't have great biomarkers uh, to really, uh, categorize these individuals and, and make a confirmatory diagnosis. And we base everything on this entity called inflammatory back pain. And it's kind of described by these different criteria here. And if you look on the right, these different um, features such as age of onset less than 40 years, it increases the odds that this is going to be an axial spondyloarthritis as opposed to mechanical back pain. And again, things like insidious onset, back pain improves with movement. Uh, it does not improve with rest. Pain is worse at night, improves with getting up and moving around. Other things such as alternating buttock pain and response to NSAIDs are often um, used to help describe inflammatory back pain. And so when I'm seeing a patient in clinic, what I'm really looking for are kind of these features of that morning stiffness. It's waking them up at about three, four, five a.m. They feel like they need to get up and move around. That helps relieve the stiffness. If they have to drive a long uh, drive to come in to see me in clinic and that makes their back pain worse. These are the things that I'm looking for that are very suggestive of an inflammatory back pain that would be consistent with axial spondyloarthritis. With the definition of inflammatory back pain, if you have three of the five features here, the sensitivity is 95% and specificity about 50% for the diagnosis of AS. So as you can see here, not great specificity. And so when we're basing it on this clinical diagnosis, about half of the time we're getting it right and half of the time we're not. So I think another barrier too, is that there's a limited knowledge about this disease amongst non-rheumatologic specialists. And so uh, this here is looking at on the left side, um, the number of inflammatory back pain features that were correctly identified by general practitioners versus the number of uh, inflammatory back pain features that were identified by specialists. And these were non-rheumatology specialists. And again, looking at these different features, um, 
very few people could identify all eight features. Specialists seem to do a little bit better than general practitioners. Um, there was uh, uh, kind of somewhere this vague in between, um, you know, four and seven features that could be identified. Uh, and so specialists doing slightly better than GPs, but still has a lot of room to go. And so what are some of these features or so what are the phys physical exam findings, I should say, in spondyloarthritis? And why is the exam always not always helpful in helping diagnose this disease? It's because the pathologic site of spondyloarthritis is this, um, this area called the enthesis which is the insertion of a tendon or ligament into the bone. And you can contrast that from the synovium, which we often talk about being in rheumatoid arthritis where the synovium gets inflamed. Here, the enthesis, which is somewhat distal from the cartilage and the synovium is getting inflamed. And when that becomes inflamed, we start to see things like tendonitis and tenosynovitis. And because it can often be oligoarticular and peripheral disease, you're often left wondering, okay, could this be like a golfer's elbow or, or a rotator cuff injury versus an inflammatory enthesitis that could be related to an underlying inflammatory arthritis like spondyloarthritis. The sites that are common are shown here with the red dots um, on the figure, suggesting these are the different areas where you can get the enthesitis. And so when I talk to my, my GP colleagues, they they look at me and they're like, well, wait, those look like fibromyalgia tender spots. And I'm like, that's, that's true. And they could be. And so it's often hard to differentiate between what could be enthesitis, uh, tenderness related to enthesitis versus fibromyalgia. And so these things, enthesitis and fibromyalgia tender points are not mutually exclusive and do require frequent reassessment when you're evaluating your patient. To help kind of tip the balance more towards enthesitis, we look at the features um, of, of additional objective findings like psoriasis or joint swelling warmth erythema or tendon swelling warmth erythema. Other qualitative features such as that those inflammatory features that we frequently talk about, about improving with mobility, worsening with rest, and things like a therapeutic trial such as uh, of scheduled NSAIDs or even a steroid injection can sometimes be helpful. And I've done this quite frequently where I've trusted. This doesn't help me if it's, a, if it's an overuse injury, but it does help me differentiate what could be um, inflammatory versus fibromyalgia. In the setting of fibromyalgia, of course, you're looking for those additional symptoms that are consistent with a pain desensitization. And so uh, sleep disturbances, mood symptoms, uh, worsening with mobility, worsening with stress, uh, and often they will fail a therapeutic trial of NSAIDs and steroids. Other exam maneuvers that can be helpful in the setting of axial spondyloarthritis is, is looking at spinal range of motion. Now, of course, um, spine range of motion tends to be preserved through uh, the early phases of disease, and often our patients do have full range of motion, especially if they fall in that non-radiographic category. Uh, when you examine them, they're, they're, for all intents and purposes, going to look fairly normal. Looking for other things such as dactylitis or sausage digits, which can be in the toes or the fingers. Looking for peripheral arthritis, as you can see here, this woman's right wrist uh, appears quite swollen compared to the left. And then you can do exam movers such as the favor or the Gaines lens, which during these maneuvers, you're really stressing the SI joint, the sacroiliac joint. And that's important because that is gonna be the earliest site of involvement in axial spondyloarthritis. If the sacroiliac joint is not involved, then it's very unlikely to be axial spondyloarthritis. Now, again, this is very early on in disease. Later in disease, these maneuvers may not cause pain because it could be fused and the patient no longer is symptomatic in those areas. But at that point, you will see radiographic evidence of disease. Other things that I'm looking for by history or on exam, are features such as psoriasis. So I'm really looking at the scalp, behind the ears, the umbilicus. I usually just ask the patient if they've had any kind of rashes in their bottom um, because that's another site where psoriasis can hide is within the crease of the bottom. Um, 
looking at nails uh, for pit, pitting, suggestive of nail psoriasis. Look for uveitis. Um, of course, this is a hypopnion um, and that would be very late in disease. And so asking patients if they've had a history of uveitis or photosensitivity um, can often be a clue. Looking um, in for signs that could suggest a GI or GU infection. And so keratoderma blenerogicum or, or other um, signs of chlamydia and gonorrhea infection uh, that could be in the skin. And then other skin rashes that could be suggestive of IBD. So not only am I asking the patients if they're having GI symptoms, I'm also doing a skin exam and trying to assess whether or not they have something that could look like a pyoderma gangrenosum or erythema didosum. Um, Now, barrier number three is really trying to confirm that diagnosis. You're you have suspicion because there's exam findings or they have inflammatory back pain features, and now you're wanting to confirm that with biomarkers, but we really don't have those for axial spondyloarthritis. We'll often check an, a CRP or an ESR, but these are a couple of studies that have been done to show that compared to individuals with mechanical back pain, Individuals with AXPA don't always have an elevated CRP, particularly if we look early in the disease course. And so while I tell my patients that if their elevated CRP or ESR could be helpful, the lack of that elevation does not exclude the diagnosis. And so um, I'll often get referrals from primary care doctors who are concerned and they're like downplaying their referral by saying, oh, well, the ESR and CRP aren't elevated. And I'm like, well, that doesn't mean that the patient doesn't have axial spondyloarthritis. So check them, but don't put a lot of stock in them if they're normal. The other biomarker that I think often gets um, misused in axial spondyloarthritis is the genetic testing for HLA B27. And so I always joke when the internal medicine residents rotate with me in rheumatology clinic and we're seeing uh, spondy patients, I joke that if it's the board's exam, HLA B27 is always the right answer. But in clinical practice, HLA B27 is never the right answer. And, and that's because the prevalence of B27 is gonna vary within different populations. And so it can be anywhere from 50 to 95%. And so if you look into these really well curated um, studies in Northern European countries, you'll see very high B27 prevalence. But then when you start to look in the United States or other countries, or maybe you start to mix in uh, individuals who also have psoriasis or also have IBD, the prevalence of HLA B27 goes down. Furthermore, spondyloarthritis as a whole, not just axial, but as a whole, all spondyloarthritis, peripheral and axial, occur in about 2% of the general population. And they occur in just about 10% of people with HLA B27. And so, kind of putting all this information together, about 80% of people with and HLA-B27 will not get ankylosing spondylitis or axial spondyloarthritis. And about 20% of people who develop axial spondyloarthritis don't have the gene. And so one of the things that I always kind of harp on is that um, B27 is used within the classification criteria that, that is kind of the basis for how we learn to diagnose the disease, right? But if you include that as part of your classification criteria, you are going to bias yourself and automatically enrich for that population. And so when we do research studies, we're really enriched for those individuals. And so we don't understand the benefit or the, um, the role of HLA B27 negativity in axial spondyloarthritis in diagnosis in biomarkers. So again, I don't really utilize B27 for making a diagnosis where it can be helpful though is in prognosis and helping determine what patients need to get more aggressive therapy because we know that if you are B27 positive um, after we've made the diagnosis, if you have the presence of that gene, you're more likely to have an aggressive course of disease. So again, remember barrier number one, all of this data is really based on Northern European populations as well. So 
what I feel the field has really gone to in axial spondyloarthritis for really making that diagnosis for really confirming it is, is it comes down to imaging. So you need to have the right clinical scenario, the history, maybe some exam findings, and then it comes down to radiography and then advanced imaging. And so I really wanna stress that you always get the pelvic x-rays, get the sacroiliac joints. The lumbar spine is too high up. You won't find early disease if you go into the lumbar spine. So always get the pelvic imaging. And so x-rays, I understand that sacral iliac uh, x-rays are really hard to read and, and, and I have trouble with them sometimes. Um, and really what you wanna do is look at your sacrum and kind of follow the joint line down on the sacral side and then follow it down on the iliac side. And here you can see that there's pretty clear joint lines um, available, but you'll notice there's areas where they become a little bit blurred. They're not crisp and clean. And that's an indication that they're sacroiliitis. On the lumbar spine, uh, lumbar spine, where there's going to be advanced disease, late stage disease, that's when you start to see squaring of the vertebral bodies, flattening of the lumbar curvature, and you can see these bridging syndesmophytes or the bamboo spine that we classically see. But keep in mind, a patient's likely to have this x-ray if they've had the disease for probably 10 years, unless they're really aggressive, but they're still gonna be several years into their disease course by the time they present with this x-ray. And we wanna find them earlier, hopefully even before we see these blurred joint margins in um, and sacroiliitis on x-rays. And where we want to be able to find it is utilizing MRI. And so if the pelvic x-rays are normal, meaning you're not seeing blurred margins, you're not seeing sclerosis in the sacroiliac joints, you really wanna get that MRI as the final step in helping establish the diagnosis. And for this, um, you get an MRI, it's semi-coronal, stir images of the pelvis. And then you also wanna get T1 weighted images. And then again, always start with pelvic imaging. Even if the patient is having symptoms in their thoracic spine, I always start with pelvic imaging. And what I'm looking for is something called bone marrow edema that occurs at the sacroiliac joint. So again, kind of here's the sacrum, and then here are the iliac crusts as they're starting to come into view of the MRI. And at this inferior margin, you can see kind of enhancement of the magnetic signal suggestive of bone marrow edema. Um, the T2 can also show you some bone marrow edema. It's not as good as the STIR, but um, at my institution, sometimes I'm kind of stuck with what I get. And so sometimes I just get a, a, the, a T2 fat suppressed um, sequences. And in the lumbar spine or even thoracic and cervical spine, what you're looking for is this bone marrow edema that gives these kind of, um, quote, shiny corners appearance. And so MRI is very sensitive for sacroiliitis, but keep in mind false positives occur. And so this was a study that was done a few years ago where they just did an MRI of people that were healthy with axial spondyloarthritis, where you can see 91% had um, what, we can, what we were scoring as positive sacroiliitis. Um, but people with chronic back pain, about 6%, 12% of runners, and then postpartum women, seem to have elevated scores suggestive of sacroiliitis on MRI. So keep in mind, again, history is important. So it's the history as well as the imaging findings that help make this diagnosis uh, in combination. So how do we treat patients with axial spondyloarthritis? And so this is kind of my very simplistic breakdown, and this is completely based off of um, uh, society guidelines that have been set out through uh, the American College of Rheumatology, the Spondyloarthritis Research and Treatment Network, as well as the uh, Psoriatic Arthritis Society. And so my simplistic breakdown of this is, I think, is there a GI or GU infection preceding the onset of symptoms? If yes, I'm thinking that this is a reactive arthritis, and I'm going to start with NSAIDs, maybe some steroids, intra-articular preferred, maybe a DMARD like methotrexate, and very unlikely would I be starting a TNF uh, biologic. This should be self-limited at about six weeks. 
If it is lasting more than six months, I am questioning the diagnosis and thinking that this patient actually probably has like true sacroiliitis or another form of spondyloarthritis. If no, I ask the question, does the patient have IBD? If yes, I'm thinking about an IBD associated spondyloarthritis and I'm breaking it down based on axial versus peripheral disease. And I can tell you this, this field continues to get complicated and I work very closely with my GI colleagues to constantly revisit what is the right treatment algorithm for our patients. Um, but usually with peripheral disease, I'm trying to enhance their established IBD therapy by, by adding on oral DMARDs. Of course, TNF inhibitors are amazing for treating both the IBD and spondyloarthritis, but not everybody responds, in which case we're starting to think about JAK inhibitors or um, maybe IL-23 inhibitors now that they're being approved for both peripheral spondyloarthritis as well as IBD. For axial disease, it really comes down to TNF inhibitors. Um, JAK inhibitors are starting to show promising data in this space. I have been having to use dual biologics and I'm happy to talk about that um, at the end during the Q&A period. In both cases, sometimes what I'll do is use celecoxib, especially if their IBD is well controlled. We'll do a trial of celecoxib to see um, if, especially if we're not 100% sure of the diagnosis, we'll maybe use some trials of celecoxib to then transition them on to either um, more biologic or oral DMARDs. Um, and I will say that the use of dual biologics is, is supported in its safety based off of a me um, meta-analysis uh, that was done by one of our gastroenterologists for refractory Crohn's disease. Presence of um, psoriasis. If psoriasis is present, I'm going down and I'm using the, the treatment um, guidelines set forth by uh, the ACR and the uh, GRAPA or the psori psoriatic arthritis societies. Um, again, you'll see number one on my list, TNF inhibitors. And they're actually suggesting TNF inhibitors before we start oral DMARDs. And then of course, there's other um, medications like IL-17 inhibitors, 12 and 23 inhibitors and JAK inhibitors. Now, if psoriasis, IBD, no infection is present, we're gonna sort and say, is this patient predominantly axial disease, meaning they are an axial spondyloarthritis or AS? Um, and that's really if you start to have a certain level of radiographic damage to make it into that diagnosis of AS. The guidelines currently say we still need to start with NSAIDs, although I wonder if this is going to change as we're about to go into a new review cycle of the treatment guidelines for ankylosing spondylitis and axial spondyloarthritis. And I think we're gonna start seeing um, us going quicker to the biologics because there's a lot of really good data suggesting that the biologics can uh, uh, delay radiographic progression, de delay that spinal fusion that, that used to be a hallmark of the disease. If they're predominantly peripheral disease, it's an undifferentiated peripheral spondyloarthritis where we're gonna start with NSAIDs, progress to oral DMARDs and then TNF inhibitors. After that, we start to think of them as like a psoriatic arthritis if we get into trouble with TNF inhibitors not being effective and needing to use other biologic agents. So now I'm gonna to transition to the second half of this talk where I'm gonna talk a little bit more about um, my, uh, about my research in uh, the mucosal barrier as being our number four barrier. And that the intestinal mucosa is key to understanding the pathophysiology of axial spondyloarthritis. Now, if we look at people who are classified as peripheral spondyloarthritis, this non-radiographic or ankylosing spondylitis, we'll find that on the left side, this is the prevalence of gut inflammation. And you can see that most individuals are normal, but in peripheral spot, up to 30% uh, have either acute or chronic inflammation, up to 50% in non-radiographics, and well over 50%, uh, probably getting closer to 60% of individuals with ankylosing spondylitis will have either acute or chronic gut inflammation for which they're not symptomatic. And what's really interesting is if we look at that SPARC score, this is that MRI degree of damage um, or uh, X-ray degree of damage too, versus their gut pathology, what we find is that those who have um, 
chronic inflammation in the gut are also more likely to have more uh, damage within their spine. And so the spectrum of axial spondyloarthritis, whether it be in the spine, the peripheral joints, um, and the other manifestations, the extra articular manifestations such as IBD, psoriasis, and uveitis, there are across all of these different diseases, shared genetic risks and elevations of key inflammatory cytokines that really when you put them together immunologically, have this type three immune response or TH17, IL-17 driven immunity that's shared among them. So just to kind of give you um, a, a immunology 101 uh, background on TH17 immunity, um, really the key cell players here are the TH17 cells. These are CD4 T cells that under the right conditions of TGF beta, IL-6 and IL-1 beta will differentiate into TH17 cells that can be activated upstream by IL-23. So you'll recognize that we're starting to inhibit this in IBD, psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis that that can trigger these TH17 cells to then produce cytokines like IL-17, also a target for therapy in psoriasis and uh, spondyloarthritis. However, other cell types, and these are more innate immune cell types, these are uh, innate lymphocytes that are basically look like T cells without the traditional T cell markers. And not only can they be stimulated by IL-23, but they also can be stimulated by IL-1 beta to make IL-17. There are also gamma delta T cells and these mucosa associated invariant T cells that can also be activated by independent pathways of IL-23 to then produce IL-17, IL-21, granzyme, interferon gamma, TNF and such that all contribute to the inflammation of spondyloarthritis. And so why do I go through all of these? Well, it's because a lot of these cells develop in the gut. Uh, TH17 cells develop in the gut in response to signals from the microbiome. Uh, as do mate cells, they come from retinoic acid, uh, which is metabolized in the gut and then can signal and uh, help uh, mature these mate cells. Additionally, ILC3s can come from the gut and get triggered by the gut microbiome. But what's also interesting is a lot of our Tregs come from the gut and are trained by, again, micro, by uh, either microbes themselves or microbial products, such as short-chain fatty acids. And so we have associated different types of bacterial dysbiosis or changes in the microbiome, such as Ruminococcus novus, associated with bowel inflammation and spondyloarthritis, that can generate different bacterial products that then result in increased barrier permeability, triggering innate immune cells, as well as adaptive immune cell development, such as the mates, the ILCs, the TH17s. Furthermore, we've learned that not only um, are these cells, uh, IL-17 producing cells, but they're also expanded in the circulation and in some tissues of individuals with, uh, with axial spondyloarthritis. And so what you'll see here is mate cells um, that are producing IL-17 are increased in individuals with axial spondyloarthritis compared to healthy controls or RA. And furthermore, if you look at the synovial fluid, they're even higher in the synovial fluid compared to the blood of individuals with AS. We see similar patterns for gamma delta cells, as well as ILC3s, where we have expansions of these within the circulation and then sometimes in the synovial fluid, and others have shown that these are expanded in the gut of patients with these disease, with um, spondyloarthritis. And so how does this TH17, um, these different cells that are producing then IL-17 contribute to the development of disease? Well, we see that whether IL-23 is involved or not, a lot of these cells will make IL-17 that can synergize with TNF coming from monocytes to then trigger mesenchymal stem cells within the bone at the site of the anthesis that then is triggered um, by WINTS and other bone proteins to cause osteoblast proliferation and pathogenic bone formation. 
So getting back to the microbiome, how could the microbiome and the mucosal immune response be contributing to all of this? And so a lot of this can come through either microbes that then produce these different factors. Our microbes are very important for generating short chain fatty acids, also eicosanoids that are decreased in rheumatoid arthritis and spondyloarthritis. And the decrease in those decreases Tregs and allows increase of Th17 cells. And then of course, all of these cytokines that we associate with spondyloarthritis. Um, I'm gonna skip through a couple of these and say, go into some of the data that we've shown where we looked more closely at the microbiome of individuals with axial spondyloarthritis. And we didn't look at just the specific bacteria that are involved, but we looked at the bacterial pathways that, that were encoded by those that were present. And what we found is that in healthy controls, a lot of healthy controls were, uh, their microbes were helping synthesize tryptophan um, and getting to this central part here. Whereas the microbes in people with axial spondyloarthritis were breaking down that tryptophan into these indoles, particularly indole 3 acetaldehyde and indole 3 acetate. We further confirmed that by taking biopsies of the distal gut from people with axial spondyloarthritis in red and then healthy controls in this light blue. And I'm just gonna really highlight those two groups, even though we had Crohn's disease and Crohn's overlapping with axial spondyloarthritis in this, but we're just gonna focus on the axial spondyloarthritis and healthy controls for this talk. And what you can see here is that the metabolites are very different and clustering over here for axial spondyloarthritis, whereas the light blue metabolites of healthy controls are clustering over here. And that basically just tells us that overall the metabolite populations are very different between the two groups. And then if we look at what's driving it being more prominent in healthy controls versus more prominent in axial spondyloarthritis, again, what we saw coming from the, the genomics of the bacteria, we were seeing in metabolites being absorbed in the intestinal tissue, increases in that indole 3 acetaldehyde, indole 3 acetate, and then another product of tryptophan metabolism, which is serotonin. And so we became very interested in what tryptophan metabolism into indoles could be doing to contribute to the development of spondyloarthritis. And so we went to a mouse model of, of arthritis, of inflammatory arthritis, and it, this is called collagen-induced arthritis. It's not a great model of any autoimmune, uh, human autoimmune disease, but it it's a model of autoimmunity where we can really just test cause and effect. And so we use this model where we immunize mice with collagen in an adjuvant, and then we boost them 21 days later. And during this time, we put mice either on a standard diet, a diet that was lacking tryptophan, although we gave them normal diet on the weekends because you can't survive. Um, tryptophan is an essential amino acid that mammals only get from their diet or we could put them on this tryptophan deficient diet, ex again, except for the weekends, and then we added in indole gavage every other day as shown here. And when we did that, we found that when you reduce the tryptophan in the diet, and this is how score of, of the arthritis, so how many digits essentially are swollen um, that we're counting, and compared to the amino acid or regular diet in black, when we took away tryptophan from their diet, we had a significant reduction in the amount of pus swelling that was occurring. But yet when we put them on that low tryptophan diet and added back in the indole, we start to see arthritis coming back. And when we looked at really what was driving this difference, you know, what was coming back in that indole um, resupplementation in a tryptophan low situation, we found that it really was the Th17 cells, both in the spleen and in the colon. And if we look at that ratio or the balance between our Th17 cells and our regulatory T cells, we see that we've really tipped the balance towards Th17 cells in the setting where we're adding indole back. So that's great, fine and good. These things are happening in the gut, but we see arthritis in the joint. Are T cells actually getting to the joint? And so again, we used a mouse model where we can actually interrogate this um, and look at cause and effect. And so um, 
I was just joking recently at a conference about how, where somebody thought I was actually a gastroenterologist based on some of the work I've done in the past. Um, and and I, I think technically I'm a mouse gastroenterologist after all of these studies, but, but in reality, I'm a clinical rheumatologist. Um, but where we did, what we did here is we actually do endoscopy in mice. And we have a mouse that uh, is transgenic to where it has a green fluorescent protein. But when you apply this light at 405 uh, nanometer wavelength, which we do through an endoscope, we can convert that fluorescence emission to red. And so afterwards we can start to see red cells. And so we do that in the gut. And then we immediately euthanize the mouse and we look at the Achilles and thesis and we don't see red cells. So we haven't done anything wonky. We don't have red cells there. But if we do this photo conversion, we wait three days, we start to see red cells appear. And these are T cells that are appearing. So we do know that T cells from the gut can traffic and go to the emphasis. More interestingly, if we look at the type of T cells that are going into the gut, we see that a lot of those red T cells going into the gut can also make TNF. They can also make IL-17, but they also have this feature of regulatory T cells called FOXP3, suggesting that you recruit into the joint or the enthesis both inflammatory TNF IL-17 T cells, but we're also recruiting in regulatory T cells. So I'm just gonna summarize here and basically say what we're learning is that there's a lot of microbes um, in the gut that through uh, either antigen or metabolites such as indole are leading to the differentiation and education of TH17 cells in the gut, probably also mates ILCs. And that some of these T cells can actually traffic through the circulation and end up at the enthesis. And it comes down to this balance of the T cells that are coming into the enthesis whether they, can, whether they cause inflammation and pathogenic bone formation, or they can be regulatory, mediate inflammation that may come, say, after a, a strain or an overuse injury and prevent that pathogenic bone formation from happening. So I'm going to conclude that saying that despite barriers in understanding axial spondyloarthritis, we're making some headway. We're increasing awareness of the disease manifestations. We're just addressing gender and race and ethnicity disparities, and we're investigating potential new biomarkers. However, there's a lot of ways to go um, and, and ground to be made in these areas. And then a uh, fourth barrier is that of the mucosal barrier, and that understanding how this is important for development of key immune cell types that contribute to disease is going to reveal no novel targets for therapy. So I'm going to stop here. I'm going to thank their, um, I have a great team in my lab at Colorado um, and also some alumni who have really contributed to the, the, uh, the publications that I've presented to you today, um, but also a lot of my collaborators, both clinical in rheumatology as well as gastroenterology, our microbiome consortium, and individuals at other institutions, including Mass General, the, the Benaroya Research Institute, and Stanford. Um, and then of course, funding sources for a lot of these studies. So I will stop my share there and be happy to take questions. Dr. Kunai, this is Keith Ehrman, who's one of the organizers of Grand Rounds. Uh, I wanna thank you so much for a fantastic talk. You know, clinical science, basic science mechanisms, it was really awesome. Just to reiterate, this is the annual Ali Ascari lecture. Ali Ascari was our you know, longtime division chief here. Um, I don't know if yeah. Ali's on the Zoom, um, but Ali, you're welcome to weigh in in a second. Um, also, I went to medical school in Denver, and Vicki Frazier was the chief resident when I was a third-year student. I think Vicki was your chair when you were chief resident at Wash U, I assume. That's right. Uh, Steve's gone to the dark side with ex express scripts, but uh, <laughs> I'll be still in that role. Anyway, well, and then, you know, welcome to Cleveland virtually. Um, Thank and you. I, I see Dr. Marguerite's on, and um, and uh, we'll probably get questions and maybe questions in the chat. And and uh, Dr. Marguerite, if you want to go first, or if anybody else. Well, I would like to first thank Christy. You know, uh, we were just together here in Cleveland. We had our annual spondyloarthritis uh, treatment and education conference. It was a 50th anniversary for discovery of the gene HLA B27. So mm -hmm. we just 
with that. So I guess I'm kind of bubbling with all the knowledge. She did a great presentation there and this was amazing. And so my question would be, Christy, to you would be, you know, uh, more and more we're learning about these, you know, uh, TH17 cell, IL-17 production, independent cells coming from and, uh, this relying on gut microbiome. And we recently, I also learned the other day at the meeting that it's the, they become pathogenic or non-pathogenic depending on the environment they are in these TH17 right. cells. And then they decide this. Do you think like since the disease um, AS starts in SI joints, do you think that's because it's cl closely uh, located to the gut? Yeah, so I've often wondered this. This is a good observation. Um, so the, the draining lymph nodes for your SI joints are the same draining lymph nodes for the distal colon, which are the inguinal lymph nodes. Um, and so I think, um, so I've always been fascinated by that, uh, you know, and I think some people have done some, some studies like lymph drainage studies in, in rats and mice to show that, that um, at least in those models that there's, there's this common lymph drainage, um, I, you know, but again, why I think, so honestly, what I think is that this trafficking be between the gut and the joint is the same as trafficking everywhere. And when we've looked at where cells go from the gut, we see them go through the lungs, we see them go through the liver, we see them go through the enthesis. And so I think that our gut trains cells about the environment, what's there, what should we tolerant, be tolerant to, and then they go out, I feel like the gut's just a training ground for them to then go out and circulate and surveil for things that are where they shouldn't be. And so I think that's what happens. Now, why do they go into the SI joint and, and, and start to cause pathology? Well, I think some of that comes into the mechanical uh, stress hypothesis where maybe there's some mechanical stress. And as I showed, both regulatory and inflammatory T cells will come in to help repair it. And it really comes down to the balance. Now that balance between regulatory and TH17 could be a lot of things such as how those cells were trained, but it could also be genetics too. Thank you. I think we have a question in the chat. Yeah, I see the role of probiotics to prevent in AS. So what I talk about um, probiotics to my patients is I kind of give this analogy of trying to plant a conifer tree in, um, or sorry, trying to plant a palm tree in a conifer forest. So I'm in Colorado, so I think about mountain forests, and I'm never going to be able to plant a palm tree there because there's not an ecologic niche for it. And so first thing you have to do is you have to create a niche. And so usually niches come when patients take antibiotics. That's going to wipe out and allow anything to come in and, and, and take root. But then not only do you need a niche, but you also need an environment that's going to continue to feed that tree once it's planted. And so the same thing with the probiotics. And there's been a lot of work that's done that suggests no matter what bacteria you have in the gut, it's going to be critical to have a diet that maintains those microbes. And so I think we're a ways off from understanding what is the, the key diet. I think the best we, those of us that do microbiome research really promote just a Mediterranean diet. That's the best evidence we've got. I know it's not always satisfying for our patients, um, but that's what we're really promoting is that, you know, if you're going to do a probiotic, um, do one after you've had uh, either a GI illness or you've had antibiotics so that you can have that probiotic take a niche. And then it's really important to have a diet that's gonna continue the maintenance of that microbiome. Thanks, I think your research is very exciting. The whole the microbiome is you know, such an interesting area and the effect on a rheumologic condition like this is really fascinating. And uh, maybe in 10 or 15 years, we'll have it all figured out. So, right, um, for sure. Um, any other questions in the chat or otherwise? Um, and if not, I want to th thank you for spending time uh, yeah. in Cleveland. Um, when I went to medical school, the medical school is on Colorado Boulevard, and Fitzgibbons was an army base, so I know it's changed just a little bit. Uh, so, yes. Minute, so, uh, 
Okay, well, thank you yeah. so much, thank you, Dr. Magre, for you know organizing the Ascari talk and really an awesome talk and uh, and, uh, and and it really um, great to hear this and to honor Dr. Ascari. Thanks, Dr. Magre. I talked to him yesterday, letting him know it was today. I even sent him a text message telling him join the talk, Dr. Ascari, but I don't know, he may be busy. Maybe some... he's on and, and shy, I can't tell. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for hosting me. I appreciate Thanks, it. Bye-bye.